Hello, I'm Rachel, and today we're leaving the cold and wet behind to visit the Canary Islands off Africa. Tenerife is a Spanish island with a climate that's tropical on the coast and subtropical inland, and today we're visiting its botanic gardens. This botanic gardens is one of the best I've ever visited. It was created by King Charles III of Spain in 1788 as a place to acclimatise tropical plants for introduction to mainland Spain. The result today is a beautiful garden full of mature trees and mouth-watering plant collections, all grown outdoors. Enough talk, let's go and see for ourselves. Making our way to the entrance of the Botanic Gardens, we can see how the whole space is flanked by a high stone wall. But oh my goodness, it seems as if the Botanic Gardens is bursting out of its confines. Giant philodendrons loom high above the garden walls and tumble down the other side. And look at the roots of this enormous aroid. It has woven its way through the fabric of the wall as it hoists itself upwards. These giant plants extend all the way along the wall and dwarf the surrounding area. Philodendrons are grown as house plants in my part of the world, but this monster climber has notions of world domination. It's time to enter the botanic gardens and pay the princely entrance fee of three euros. This includes a colour brochure and map. At home, you'd barely get a cup of coffee for that price, but here on Tenerife Island, it allows you entry to paradise. To our left and right is the philodendron tunnel, but we're going to pleasure postpone and leave that special treat for the end of our tour. The first sight to greet us is a majestic tree draped in Spanish moss. Grey strands droop down, softening the whole area. Spanish moss, of course, is an air plant and in nature it's epiphytic on trees. It doesn't need soil to root into. Instead, it grows from branch to branch and subsists in a symbiotic way with its host tree, never harming the tree. Spanish moss is soft to the touch and very tactile. It grows very well as a companion plant to orchids, helping to conserve water and keep plants hydrated. And that brings us to the epiphytic tree. I remember my first time seeing this tree nine years ago and it's just as breathtaking today. The tree is adorned with all kinds of air plants and bromeliads, not so many orchids, but proper mature specimens. They were originally attached to the tree to get them going, but now they expand by themselves and flower in the way nature intended. Okay, it's time to climb the steps and enter the main section of the garden. Apologies that I don't have my tripod with me. I don't take it on family holidays, so you can expect a bit of wobble. Today, we're going to see some magnificent specimens of tropical plants. We're going to see Plenty of house plants growing outdoors in their natural habitat. I probably won't be able to resist pointing out ones that I grow in my greenhouse in Ireland. And there'll be lots and lots of plant detail. First up, look at this intriguing elephant ear fig from India. It produces edible fruits, which you can see here clustered directly on the trunk. The majority of trees produce flowers and fruit on their branches, so it's surprising to see that stuff coming directly from the trunk. Next up is the calabash tree from Africa and America. It's the national tree of St. Lucia Island in the West Indies. Yes, that's a pineapple. These fruits might look edible, but they're used as cups or bowls to carry water. One of the things that really strikes me is how the understory of trees is filled. 
at home, these clivias are grown as house plants or greenhouse plants. And we need to satisfy ourselves with hostas or epimediums for those shady garden spots. Here, clivias thrive in the shaded areas under trees. Here's another tropical shade loving plant, this time from Brazil. It can be hard to tell what plant this is from its leaves, but the flowers on this bromeliad relative are unmistakable. It's hard to equate how easily this fussy plant flowers here and how hard it was for me to grow it at home. Here's another Brazilian bromeliad. This one has hieroglyphica as its species name because of the cool markings on its leaves. It makes a super house plant because the leaf patterning adds interest even when it's not in flower. In my climate though, it really is a house plant rather than a greenhouse plant. I lost mine by subjecting it to lows of five degrees Celsius in the greenhouse. Here we have some type of bilbergia. This botanic garden is known for its spectacular collection of bromeliads. Most bromeliads have very small root systems for the size of their tops and low nutrient requirements. In other words, they need very little feeding. Most will hold water in the rosettes. The best known bromeliad of all is the pineapple, which we've already spotted. This giant bromeliad is from Brazil and called Alcantaria. The Alcantaria family are not prickly and spiny like so many of the Brahms, and check out the flowers. The stem is a deep pinky red with bracts adorned by waxy lemon flowers which are flat and rigid. Being a bromeliad, the flowers last a long time. After flowering, the rosette usually dies, but not before putting out pups to the side, which will then take over in due course. I tell you what, Let's leave the bromeliads for the moment, although we will be back and take a look at some fantastic trees. This is the kapok or cotton tree. This majestic tree is cultivated for its cotton-like seed fibre in Southeast Asia. The trunk and many of the larger branches are crowded with large, simple thorns and it has palmate leaves. Lots of history and folklore surround this tree, but my favorite story is from Trinidad and Tobago. The castle of the devil is a huge kapok tree growing deep in the forest. And here the demon of death was imprisoned by a carpenter. The carpenter tricked the devil into entering the tree in which he carved seven rooms, one above the other into the trunk. Folklore claims the devil still resides in that tree. So, who can guess what seasonal tree this heavily pollarded one is? I think the red flowers are the real giveaway. This is the poinsettia, so commonly available at Christmas. But what you might know is that poinsettia is a common name and this tree is actually a euphorbia. And our final tree before we move on to some flowers is the Australian banyan. The most striking feature of this giant tree is its buttress roots. Buttress roots are found in nutrient poor tropical forest soils that may not be very deep. They prevent the tree from falling over, hence the name buttress, while also gathering more nutrients. Our next flowering plant makes a handsome clump with pretty violet flowers. The flowers are so unlikely looking that you'd be forgiven for thinking they're artificial. This plant was formerly Tillandsia, so an air plant, but it's now known as Wallisia. In any case, we're talking epiphyte, but what a little gem it is. Our next flower is striking and spider-like and snowy white. It's Hymenocallus, a bulb from Central America in the Amaryllis family, and it's closely related to Pancrasium. It's a plant that many try in their home in a pot. 
Next up is the mottled tooth thread. And if you think that's a mouthful, you should try its botanic name. This is a plant originally from Mexico with scarlet red flowers. We now move on to Brazil and the Brazilian red cloak plant. This is one I have in my greenhouse, but I struggle to flower it. Its genus is Megascapasma, and it's a monotypic genus of plants. This means that the whole genus only contains one single species, this one. A few succulents now from South Africa, and I have to tell you, I'm like this whenever I visit a garden. I jump from place to place, led by my excitement. I just can't be hemmed in by a map. We now recognise aloha arborescence here by its yellow teeth. Other aloas may have red or orange teeth along the edge of their leaves. And here we have an enormous clump of aloha plicatilis. Actually, this aloha has now changed its name to Kumara, but many still know it as an aloha. When I visited nine years ago, visited this botanic gardens, this clump was half its current size. It's a very handsome plant, makes a great pot specimen, and I need to get my hands in one. Over here, we have the ornamental purple torch or Bartlettina sordida. This one flowered for me in my greenhouse this summer with its soft purple umbels. It's a great foliage plant if grown in a shaded position. Lovely soft leaves. There are also plenty of bulbs in evidence. Big juicy crinum bulbs like these, mostly from Crinum murii. However, I'm delighted to spot Crinum asiaticum here. This crinum is a different animal altogether than ordinary small ones. Commonly known as poison bulb or giant crinum lily, how imaginative. This is a plant species widely planted in many warmer regions as an ornamental plant. It's a bulbous forming perennial, producing an umbel of large showy flowers that are prized by gardeners. All parts of the plant are, however, poisonous. Now we take a look at some cycads. Cycads typically have a stout and woody trunk with a crown of large, stiff, evergreen leaves. The genus is Dioecious. That means the individual plants are either male or female. They typically grow very slowly and live very long. Because of their superficial resemblance, they're sometimes mistaken for palm trees. This lone female cycad from the Congo in Africa has been growing here for more than 100 years on her own. In 2002, however, she was finally hand pollinated with pollen from a tree in a botanic garden in continental Spain. And the happy news is that now she is surrounded with several of her offspring. This tree isn't a cycad, but a giant relative of the bird of paradise. You know what? To find out more, look out for my upcoming video on palm trees. Now let's have a little look at some popular house plants when they're allowed to do their thing. This is mother-in-law's tongue and what enormous clumps it makes and the very popular spider plant, here used as an edging to the path. The genus Dreisina is represented here with two popular species used as house plants. These trees are low maintenance, needing only warm temperatures, low light and ad hoc watering to do well in a home environment. But look what they can become if allowed.
Right at the back of the garden, we pass by some heavily scented Brugmansias. But there's also a set of steps, so of course we're going to climb them. At the very top, we find a peaceful area of water and shade, perfect for sitting out, but I'm not one for sitting around when there are plants to be seen. The right hand side of the Botanic Gardens features a banana grove, so we'll have a romp through there now. Although bananas grow as tall as trees, banana and plantain plants are not woody and their apparent trunks are made up of the bases of their huge leaf stalks. So bananas are not trees at all, but technically gigantic herbaceous plants. Most edible bananas are seedless and sterile, and that's because they've been bred by us to produce nice fruit at the expense of the plant's natural disposition. Mixed in here with the bananas are Strelitzia, or bird of paradise, and Heliconia, or lobster claw. The growth habit of bananas is very similar to that of Canna's, Strelitzia, and Heliconia as they're all related and when there are no flowers it can be really difficult to tell the difference. Here's some footage of the beautiful Heliconias in bloom in this very spot but on a rainy day. But enough rain, let's get back to our sunny visit. Moving on now to some vicious looking characters and this is the Salaka tree from Malaysia and Indonesia. It has lethal spines but produces fruit that is edible raw when mature. It would need to be exceptionally tasty fruit for me to consider growing something as vicious as this. The next plant is Colesia and it has the common name of crown of thorns. I think it's obvious why. This is a deciduous bush with small scented flowers in winter. The triangular leaves are quite interesting. Our next plant is known as palm grass and comes from places in Asia and Australia. It's clump forming and often grown as an ornamental. The fibres from the plant are used for making nets and the fruit is edible. It's very easy to mix this plant up with baby palm trees or curculigo, which is what I thought it was when I visited here last time. This is the bird's nest fern and it's actually epiphytic. They have lots of handsome clumps of this here. Anyone who watches my greenhouse videos will recognise this beautiful South African bulb, but just look at the enormous clumps they have here. It's known as the shaving brush plant for obvious reasons and it's evergreen and winter flowering. Mine has a considerably reduced flowering this winter, probably because it was repotted. Our next plant is from the ginger family. Spiral flag is native to Sri Lanka, India and several African countries. It's found in woodlands and the border of paddy fields in wetland areas in Sri Lanka. Tiny white flowers will soon emerge from the tight ball of green bracts that's emerging from the ground. So, let's have a final look at a few more bromeliads in bloom before we move on to the philodendron tunnel. This one is from the genus Pitcarnia, but despite its name, it's from Central America. This one has the most amazing yellow flower.
This bromeliad is among the ones known as tank bromeliads because they grow close together and form spaces for collecting large volumes of water. This is one of the plants that has a symbiotic relationship with ants. It provides the ants with shelter and water and the ants provide it with nutrients. In fact, a study has shown that the health as well as colour and flower size of the plant has been found to be directly related to colonisation by ants. The jack tree is a species of tropical tree related to the fig. It's well suited to tropical lowlands and it's widely cultivated throughout tropical regions of the world. It bears the largest fruit of all trees. A single fruit can measure as much as 90 centimetres, that's 35 inches in length. I've only ever tasted one from a can. I bet they're delicious. This here is the mosaic fig, the variegated form. It was discovered by a Sydney gardener who collected it from the South Seas on an expedition in 1869. Variegation is caused by a virus and this plant produces continuously small marble-sized figs. The fruit are colliferous and that means that they form from the main trunk rather than from new growth and shoots just like the elephant ear fig we saw earlier. Our last stop before the philodendron tunnel is the orchid area. Here we have an area covered in shade cloth and air plants set the scene. There are some hanging plants in baskets too, like this aroid with its long, long, thin leaves. The orchid section does seem to have reduced since I was here last, but the paths are flowering well. And do look what we have here. This is my Sobralia, the orchid I keep in a pot and eventually got to flower this summer. Look at it, planted outdoors in the open air here. The philodendron tunnel is where the botanic garden houses a large number of aroids. These are plants from the Araceae family. This is also sometimes referred to as the Arum family. No other group of plants can compare to aroids for exotic and extravagant foliage, making them extremely desirable and sought after house plants. Besides their amazing foliage, aroids are characterized by an inflorescence or flower that's pollinated by flies and beetles, often attracted by foul scents. This aroid tunnel has been designed to provide shade, climbing supports and moisture to the plants we see here today. The largest genus in the aroid group is that of the anthurium and the second largest is that of the philodendron. Philodendrons are largely epiphytic and have juvenile leaves that differ considerably from their mature leaves. 
Some mature philodendrons have significant trunks which are composed of scarring left by leaves that have withered and fallen away. The scar patterning on these supposed trunks can be an attractive feature in its own right. The first specimen of note here is the giant philodendron. This oversized beauty has shiny undulating leaves and just look at him go! This mouth-watering philodendron is gloriosum. It comes from Colombia and its surround and it has velvety foliage with striking white veins. It's a terrestrial plant and has a creeping habit rather than being a climber. Now for an absolutely stunning philodendron. This one is called the black gold philodendron. It's from South America and has dark green leaves with brilliantly contrasting yellow veins. The leaves can get as large as 24 inches and it's a climber. Like the other two philodendrons, this one is also a species. Oh, I want one of these. Our final aroid is blue taro and this one has arrow shaped leaves as many aroids do and gorgeous dark purple leaf stalks. This beauty is grown as a house plant in my part of the world as are the other three philodendrons but it's just wonderful to see what these plants can do if allowed reach their potential. I'm sad to say we have now finished our visit to the Botanic Gardens here in Puerto on Tenerife Island. I hope you enjoyed this amazing, amazing place as much as I did and that you'll check back soon for some more videos from Tenerife. Thanks for watching and have a wonderful day.